Okay, hello, welcome to the last video in the photosynthesis series from Mr. Gill's Science Stuff. Welcome back to the Science Shack. Um, sorry if the last two videos got cut off, there's been some uh, shack related IT space issues down here which hopefully I've resolved. But this should be a really short one, it's just mopping up a few of the little bits that we haven't done. The bulk of your photosynthesis topic is light dependent, light independent reaction, so if you know those things, you're pretty much onto a winner. Okay, so as you see here, we're going to go through chromatography and limiting factors in this very short little video. So, uh, chromatography is something you're almost certainly going to have to do on whatever A level course or whatever it is you're doing. It's one of the classic ways of separating out photosynthetic pigments. You'll probably do something like this, it may even be a required practical on your course. Um, essentially, you've done it before, probably lower down the school. Pigments in uh, chlorophyll all have different solubilities. Some of them will dissolve easily in particular solvents, some of them won't, and that varies by solvents. Now, chlorophyll isn't very water soluble, right? but it is solvent in, uh, is dissolvable in organic solvents. Reason for that, of course, is think where it lives. It lives embedded in a phospholipid membrane. If you think back to AS level, you'll know that means it has to be a non polar, uncharged molecule that will sit nicely. In a membrane okay so what you do is by some method you smush your, your leaf or you get your pigments onto the paper just here now in some uh, experiments you see that written as blend up the leaf extract the pigments and dab them on that's a really really good way in other methods you have the much quicker much dirtier way of literally punch a hole out of the leaf and just press it on okay both work the solvent extraction is more effective you get a darker spot and one of the things you're often asked is, how do you make sure you can see the pigments? Well, you do it multiple times, or put lots of concentrated pigment on there to make sure that you get a nice concentrated spot. Another common question, this line has to be pencil because you don't want ink from your pen running up the paper with the photosynthetic pigments, okay? You then lower your photosynthesis, your uh, chromatography paper into this tube here, which has got solvent in the bottom. The solvent line must be below the origin line. Reason for that, of course, is if you put the solvent over the dot, then all the solvent's just going to come off the paper and move into the solvent itself, okay, and disappear. And we want travel upwards. You also shouldn't have it touching the sides, as it isn't here, because then you get kind of an edge effect where the solvent runs faster up the edges and you get squiffy, um, you get squiffy chromatography, okay? Fancier versions will use a glass plate with silica powder on it that's uh, called thin layer chromatography right that's basically um, sort of fancier version you get better separation and the blender solvents can vary from experiment to experiment and you'll get different results depending on which pigments you use or which solvents you use so this is sort of typical that you get here right afterwards you'll get a separation of pigments now the RF value is simply a ratio of where the um, solvent front got to and where the individual pigment got to. Now, that's really important that you draw that on the minute you take the bit of paper out because the solvent will evaporate and you won't be able to see it. Okay? It also allows for, and this is an exam answer, allows for a comparison between different chromatography papers, different chromatograms, where the solvent ran a different distance. Okay? And here are some typical RF values. Keratin usually comes out first with an RF value of 0 0.95, so it runs about 95% the way, the distance of the solvent, very, very soluble in most organic solids, uh, solvents, and then xanthophyll, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B. They're never that clean. They're always kind of sort of blurring in together, and you've got to use a little bit of intuition to find them. Um, generally in school lab experiments, they kind of run together, and you've got to make a decision consistently about whether you measure the front or the center of the dot. A lot of mark schemes say you should measure the center of a pigment dot and use that for your RF values. I find that's really quite difficult to do when they're all blurred together, so I kind of prefer to try and work out where the front is and get an RF value from that. That obviously will affect your results, but as long as everyone's doing the same method, they will be comparable. Okay, So that is your um, standard chromatography. It's dead easy practical to do, really, really standard. Okay. The other questions you may well get in photosynthesis test or topic test about limiting factors. We've discussed lots of things at GCSE, and this is exactly the same, that can limit the rate of photosynthesis. So on this one here, look, our uh, x-axis is the intensity of light. As you can see, initially, as we turn the light up, the rate of photosynthesis goes up. Right. So in this section of the graph here, light intensity 
is the limiting factor because more light means more photosynthesis. Now with a low CO2 concentration and cold temperature, at this point here, we're cranking the light up, cranking the light up, making no difference. So the limiting factor is one of those things, lower CO2 and lower temperature. Right? It's not light. So you can crank the light up as much as you like, it won't make a difference. You've got to change the CO2 or the temperature to make a difference. Okay. So in this one here, a higher CO2 concentration but still a low temperature pushes it up further, and a higher CO2 concentration, high temperature pushes it up even further. There's always an economics argument. This is usually an agriculture style question. What is it worth doing, right? Because of course you've got to pay for heating and you've got to pay for CO2. So that's what we mean by limiting factors. If turning up the thing on the x-axis makes the rate go faster, then the thing on the x-axis is the limiting factor. If you've got a plateau like this, something else is the limiting factor. On this graph it tells you, but it's perfectly reasonable for you to make a suggestion, okay? Now, it takes up to A-level standard. It could also be that if there's loads of light, low, good, decent temperature, loads of CO2, loads of water, the limiting factor is that special enzyme, Rubisco itself. Look back at the light-independent reactions. The limiting factor can be the rate of that enzyme. Okay? And that's limiting factors. And the last thing I'm going to introduce you to is this idea of a compensation point, which you may do an experiment to derive. Essentially, plants do photosynthesis and they do respiration because they're alive. So in the dark, they're doing more respiration than photosynthesis, and in the light, they're doing more photosynthesis than respiration. Okay? The respiration stays at a fairly steady rate. The reason there's this little bulge in it is purely temperature, because uh, uh, respiration is an enzyme-controlled reaction, and it's warmer in the day. But as you can see, it's pretty constant. Okay? But this line here shows photosynthesis. So from here to here, in the daylight hours, it's producing more oxygen, Right? It's producing more oxygen or uh, producing more sugar than it's using. And in these areas, it's taking in more of those things because of the lack of light. Okay, These points here, where the amount of oxygen produced and used, the amount of sugar produced and used, are exactly the same. Okay, Those are called the compensation points. That's when the plant is absolutely neutral. And it might be that you need to find a, a light level in an experiment that leads to that exact compensation point. Okay? But that's what that phrase means, should you ever see it. It's also why it's a bad idea to have potted plants in the bedroom overnight because they compete with you for oxygen rather than providing oxygen because it is dark, of course, unless you sleep with the lights on. Okay? With that, that's a very quick run through all the other odds and ends in the photosynthesis topic. Good luck with any tests you have to take.